This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Every once in a while, I get to appear on someone else's podcast and expand on the work I've been doing in history, philosophy, and in building Renegade University. I had one of my best such experiences just recently during my appearance on Mance Raider's Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast. Mance Raider is also known as my friend, Pete Quinones. I love being on Pete's show because he always gives me the space and the time to really dig into some of the topics I don't get to talk about on Unregistered. During my interview with Pete, we covered an incredible array of topics, from the higher education monopoly that Renegade University is taking on, to the checkered history of Jews in America, the place of Nietzsche in the history of philosophy, the central importance of the Stonewall riots in the history of American freedom, and my argument, based on several years of research for the book that I'm finishing now, that the United States' entry into World War II didn't cause the Holocaust, but it guaranteed its fulfillment. This is my appearance on the Free Man Beyond the Wall podcast with Pete Quinones. Thad, welcome back to the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Pete. Thanks for having me back. Oh, no problem, man. I wanted to have you uh, on again because Renegade University is full steam ahead and I know you have an event coming up, and I wanted to talk about some of the themes that you guys are doing at Renegade University, but before we get into that, why don't you talk about what's coming up for are you? Yeah, we've got basically what is always my highlight of the year for me personally, which is our what we call the Renegade Weekends, Renegade University Weekends. We've had five of them so far in cities all across the country. This time, it's going to be in my hometown of Oakland or the Bay Area. I grew up in Berkeley and Oakland, and I am so excited to bring people here and show them around. For VIPs, we're going to do a walking tour of the renegade history of San Francisco, and then I'm going to take them to my very favorite bars and restaurants in North Beach, which is, I, I think, the coolest and most historically important also neighborhood in the city. But then the weekend events will be in Oakland at a really cool warehouse space that I found in downtown Oakland, which is totally happening. Oakland has become sort of the new San Francisco because San Francisco is almost largely ruined with the combination of bland tech workers and the hordes of homeless people in the streets. Anyone who's been there recently knows exactly what I'm talking about. And it's just sort of like the, the counterculture left San Francisco about 20 years ago with the advent of tech. Not that I'm anti-tech, it's just that they tend not to be very cutting edge in the way they think or behave. But the nice part is that a lot of the countercultural people went to the East Bay. And so right now in Oakland and Berkeley, where we're having Renegade University, where the weekend's happening. It's just, it's the most diverse, fascinating collection of people I've ever been around. I really love living here again. I hadn't lived here in about 20 years. I'd lived in New York and LA in the meantime. But coming back's been wonderful. I mean, of course, there are lots and lots of SJW types, and there's lots of that kind of thinking, but there's much, much more here. I found that it's it hasn't irritated me nearly as much as I thought, and in fact, I really love being here. So, we're going to have the weekend events at this warehouse space downtown Oakland. The VIPs will get the Renegade History history Tour of San Francisco the night before. And then the uh, I think the highlight of the weekend uh, will be the party for everybody on Saturday night at, and this is sort of an announcement, I have not been making this public until just now, I live on an agorist urban farm in East Oakland. And we will have the party here 
at that farm. In fact, you might hear roosters crowing, no kidding, as we're talking, right behind me. So that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to also have a special, very special guest this time. Listeners of Unregistered will know him, Daniel Coffeen, who uh, he's been on the show twice, been on my show twice. He has a course at Renegade University that's on sale on Nietzsche. It's an introduction to the ideas of Nietzsche, which is one of our best-selling courses already. Gotten lots of hits, lots of attention. He was, he is a PhD from the very famous rhetoric department, UC Berkeley, and hated being an academic, felt constrained, felt politically incorrect. <laughs> this might sound familiar, and was essentially tossed out, even though he was by far the most popular professor there. So he and I have a lot in common there. Um, and he's a really brilliant guy. And he, although he and I, we think we think a lot alike, and we have this similar attitudes toward academia, but. We are interested in different things. So he's very interested in language, and he's going to give a little discussion about seeing the world differently, about perceiving the world and about talking and interacting, using affect and feelings and emotions as evidence and as sort of just a way of interacting with the world versus sort of a very cold, hard rationality that you often find in social science and especially in politics and especially these days with this sort of uh, very dumb partisanship that's become dominant. So it's 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 almost hard to explain, but those who know Caffeine from the podcast will know that he really makes the world look differently when you talk to him. He may, he that's what he's done for me. When I when I talk to Daniel, I just I walk out of out of the studio or out of the house wherever we're doing the recording, and I just I see everything and I feel everything differently. He's very much influenced by Zen Buddhism as well, as, as I am. And so sort of the ideas of mindfulness he brings into intellectualism. And he's when I he's not at all airy fairy. He's actually very hard headed and just super, super incisive about politics, about culture, about film. He's an expert cinephile, an analyst of film. And in fact, we're going to start doing a series in which he and I analyze films, which we're really looking forward to. It will be on YouTube. So he'll be there this weekend. Great guy to hang out with. Great guy to talk to. He's a huge. He has a lot of fans from my show. Love him. And uh, we're gonna have a blast. There's also gonna be a, a happy hour, a free happy hour on fr on Saturday. It's gonna be, I think, the best of the weekend events that we've had so far. Because there's gonna be more sort of socializing and social interaction and just fun stuff, as well as like the you know the heavy intellectual stuff that people come for. And also a feeling of community, which is what RU weekends almost always give people. Because as I'm sure a lot of your listeners can relate to this, you know, a lot of us who have different ideas feel isolated, feel alone where we live. It's hard often to talk to people who we are most close to, you know, especially our intimate relations. You know, it's, it's hard to find, you know, a wife and close friends or a husband uh, right around you who think like we do, right? I mean, this is a, uh, this is a tough thing. So, what people tell me when they come to the RU weekends is they love, you know, hanging out with me and talking to me. And, and also you get to be on the podcast, by the way, that's the end. We end the weekend with a live recording of the unregistered podcast in which the audience can participate. So it's, it's the one chance that listeners of the show get to be on the show. But they say, and besides those things, which they really love, what they most love actually is, is being with each other and finally getting to talk to people who, who think differently or think like them. It's just, it's an amazing thing to watch and people feel free for the first time or the only time during the year. And it's, as I said, for me, it is absolutely always the highlight of my whole year these weekends. They are absolutely thrilling. So this is going to be April 24th to April 26th in Oakland and San Francisco. And if you want more information and to get tickets, just go to renegadeuniversity.com backslash live. It's the RU live section of Renegade University. I have to agree with you about the getting around people who are like-minded. Go into any event where like-minded people, um, even the events that go on there aren't as fun or fulfilling as just sitting around and talking and just, you know, hammering out ideas and putting ideas out there. I mean, that's, that's the joy for me. You know, I, I can go to and miss most of the lectures and just be out there, you know, arguing and talking with people and having that. that that's fun to me. So, yeah, social isolation sucks. You know, <laughs> I mean, it really sucks. And I've experienced it my whole life in a way. It's sort of odd. I mean, I've always, you know, been in relationships. I have a son and I've always, you know, had friends and people around me. But it's sort of like, you know, it's, they tend to be the ones I can't talk politics with. Right. 
I can't talk about these these ideas with either they're not interested or they just have totally different ideas and it turns into a fight right away. I'm sure a lot of your listeners are relating to me right now. <laughs> um, and and so what ends up happening is people like us go online and we do that kind of talking online or we listen to podcasts or, you know, we text our friends who live across the country. But the, I think in person stuff and this is why at Renegade University, you know, we are a mix and always have been committed to doing both online courses and online education and in-person events like this because it is it feeds the soul, man. It feeds the soul and it makes you gives you hope and it makes you feel like you're part of something that's bigger, you know, and not to sound like a commie, but you know, it's a community and I think community intentional voluntary community <laughs> is essential. It's something that often I think libertarians sort of miss. They don't quite get that. It's not that they're, that they're opposed to the idea. I just think they tend to not emphasize it as much as they should because they think maybe it's sort of what socialists do. But I think that people with our kinds of politics, and I'm not calling myself a libertarian, but people with just different politics, those of us who are ostracized, alienated, and isolated need to find it especially. So these weekends are are really good for the soul, really good for the heart, and really good for making us feel less isolated and alone. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. All right. Let's jump into this. Yeah. Something that we've never talked about w with you on the show before is the higher, what you called yesterday when we were talking was the higher education scam. I mean, it's one of the reasons why Renegade University exists. So mm -hmm. why don't you explain to everybody what exactly, how the scam actually works? It is wild, and it's so wild that I didn't even know about it, having been a professor at you know regular elite universities for 20 years and having – I think I'd even started Renegade University before I even knew about this. So the higher education system in the United States of America is a state-created, state-enforced monopoly. It's somewhat similar to the way that media was until the 1980s, right? And which was that the FCC granted licenses only to those it deemed respectable. So that meant that the only TV networks were NBC, CBS, and ABC, and PBS. And that was it. Same with radio and same with newspapers even. But um, that's what's been going on in higher education in diff with different iter iterations since the very beginning, since the early 19th century. So it began, of course, with land grants given to colleges and universities. They were given the land by the federal government. So right there, that's uh, some nice regulatory capture, making it hard for uh, new entrants into the market. And then in the, in the 20th century, the accreditation system was created. And at first, that was just private. At first, uh, accreditation agencies were established in each region, each geographical region, and they were the ones who determined whether a college or university was good enough, right, to be, to have, to give college credit. But quite quickly, under good old Lyndon Baines Johnson in 1965, it went under the purview of the Department of Education. So the accreditation agencies have to be accredited by guess who? Uncle Sam, the Department of Education. So they accredit the accreditors, and then the accreditors accredit the universities, and then the universities that are accredited give credit. <laughs> so when I founded RU, people asked, well, can you give college credit? And I looked into it, and it turned out that according to the rules that are established by the accreditation agencies, which are propped up by the federal government, I had to have a certain number of dorm rooms. I had to have a library with a certain number of volumes. I had to have a certain number of professors all of whom who had to have PhDs from certain kinds of institutions. <laughs> I mean, it went on. I had to have a cafeteria. <laughs> and so I couldn't give credit. And it's, you know, the barrier to entry is basically insurmountable unless you're a billionaire. So that's why most of, all, basically all of the so-called elite prestigious schools in this country are, you may have noticed, more than 100 years old. Because they've been propped, unlike any other industry, think of another industry in which all the dominant businesses or most of the dominant businesses are a century old or more. There isn't one, right? I mean, and so that's because of this, this whole system of state enforced monopoly that's been imposed and that people are unaware of. Even professors like me don't know. But when I talk about when I talk about this to professors now, they have no idea what I'm talking about. So, you know, I at first thought, well, we need to wage a political campaign and go talk to if we can go talk to Betsy DeVos and get her to get her to end this system, which is horrible. 
But then I realized, you know, several, several people talked me out of that and, and I realized they were right. What we need to do rather than people may know about Voice and Exit, the Hirschman book, the famous book in which he argues that there's two ways of making social change. One is through voice, which means democratic participation, which is the kind of stuff I'm talking about here, going and protesting and and petitioning the government and or pleading with the government to change. And then there's exit, which is to leave the system and do or make your own thing. And that's what I decided to focus on instead. So for the last two years, my partners and I have been working pretty much around the clock. And I mean that because we even, we even have a, our videos are now being made 24 seven by a Hollywood post-production house uh, doing incredible quality. And you can see if you go to if you go to the YouTube channel, you can see lessons from each of our new courses and the quality, the video quality is just off the charts. Um, and that's a 24 seven production. So we are cranking out content. We are adding professors and instructors pretty much every day and putting on new events like the one coming up in April all the time. And the podcast keeps churning out content. And now we're moving to more video content. We just had a video podcast, which we, you and I were just talking about before we started rolling with Abby Martin, the famous Abby Martin, which is just beautiful. I urge people to go to the unregistered channel, YouTube channel and take a look at that. Unregistered is going to start looking more and more like that. We're going to do more video content. So we're building the thing and people are coming. We've had people come. We've had, as I said, we've had five weekend events so far all over the country. We've had people fly from Australia. We've had people fly from London. We've had people come from about 30 to 35 different states within the United States to these things. They come from all over and it's a, it's a glorious thing. And the more I build this, the less I am angry at the higher education system that expelled me for having wrong ideas and for being the wrong color and being the wrong gender. And the more just happy and content I am having my own space and a space that people come to in which they feel a part of a community and in which they learn they learn freely and they speak freely and they can think freely, unlike at universities and colleges, which are so stultifying. Anybody who's been around them knows this. I mean, they are, I often call them the last monasteries, right? They're really, and they're modeled after the medieval, medieval monasteries. In fact, you know, we're, we're basically priests were trained. So, uh, yeah, we're building this thing and it's making me happy. It's making people around me happy. It's thrilling. We have a lot of people working for us and with us now as partners, who just are, are doing it just because they're excited about the prospects. And here's the best part of all. There's no limit to how big we can become. We're just, we just keep adding courses and they're there forever for people to watch, to listen to, to think about. You can always click, become a member. You can always click and buy a course or watch a course. You can always click and talk to one of us one-on-one. -on -one. We have a thing called office hours where you can talk directly with me or any of our instructors via uh, teleconferencing or the phone if you want, which has been wonderful. I've been doing that with people, just having one-on-one -on -one conversations, really relaxed, you know, from your home to my home, but we're looking right at each other and talking to each other. Really, again, talking about community, you know, that's what we're, that's what we're about. We're about interaction, not just sending out a video and having you watch it. Um, we also have online seminars, which, you know, 10 or 20 people and me or another instructor talking directly to each other, you know, so we're basically offering, not basically, we are offering more than Harvard ever has because everybody, first of all, the students are all basically top quality. You know, the only reason they are coming to your class is because they want to come to this class and learn from you and learn the topic. Kids at Harvard take a lot of courses that they have to take. They often don't even know what the professor, who the professor is or anything about them, but until they get into that classroom. It's a lot of passive learning in those places. They often, in the larger, more prestigious school, they never even get to talk to the professors. It's all sort of with a teaching assistant. But here, it's us to you directly. And the, so the quality of the students is just 100%. They also tend to be older and wiser and better educated. They're not 18-year-olds right out of high school. You know, these are people with real lives, real experiences. And I learned just tons from RU students, unlike when I was teaching teenagers. So... We're a different thing, a better thing, and we're going to be a bigger thing. And the best part is it costs pennies on the dollar compared to places like Harvard or UC Berkeley. Mm. Well, I wanted to give people examples of you know what you guys are doing there. And there's one course that, I mean, it's one that I think a lot of people would have loved to have seen when they were in college, and it's you know, History of Race. Mm -hmm. And I thought 
because I love your book, uh, Renegade History of the United States, you did a chapter in there about Jews in America and how their perception starting out and their evolution coming forward. So, you know, that's something that a lot you're not going to really hear about in in college. You may hear about it on a couple podcasts, but not like this. So, um can you give an example, <laughs> you know, using you know, using what you did in your book of um how you know, the kind of things that people would learn? Yeah. It's funny I, when as you were speaking, I was just reminded of Michael Malice. I'm sure a lot of your listeners know about him who's been on my show three times now. And we had a conversation about his book on the new right and his, in particular, his interview with Jared Taylor. Again, (laughs) someone a lot of your people might know about, you know, and malice brought up to Taylor that history in my book about how the Jews in this country, actually in, in Europe and in this country were before until world war two considered to be black or at least an inferior race to whites. They were not considered to be white. And Taylor had no idea about this history. It was just complete news to him. (laughs) (laughs) Because he now, I think, he believes that Jews are white and they are also of the superior race to blacks or something like that. But um, it it was absolute news to him that not very long ago at all, Jews were considered to be sort of an animalistic, primitive race similar to or just like Africans. And that was true until World War II. And for some good reasons, I mean, it wasn't just dumb racism. Jews in this country, when they got here, beginning in the late 19th century, in large numbers anyway, tended to live in poor neighborhoods where African Americans lived, like in the Lower East Side in New York City, and just in slums generally, because they were poor. They were poor immigrants. They came not with the nice, tidy little nuclear family that Americans love so much, but with the big extended family with grandpa, grandma, aunts, uncles, cousins, friends, all taking care of the kids, which I think is a better model, by the way. And it's certainly easier and and easier for the parents. And I think it's better for the kids. But that was considered to be gross and primitive, as I said, and beneath American standards. And then Jews, beginning with the early 20th century, they were dominant in popular music and popular entertainment. So vaudeville was a Jewish creation and vaudeville was the first time that women took off their clothes on stage and were paid for it. Vaudeville was the first time that comedians used dirty jokes in their acts and got big laughs and became stars. Vaudeville was the first time that blacks and whites performed on stage together and got became stars. Vaudeville was the basis for much of what we see on TV, what we hear on the, I'm using anachronistic terms here, radio, um, (laughs) Spotify, (laughs) what we see on YouTube, what we see on the internet. A lot of it was started by vaudeville. Jews were also owners of most of the nightclubs in places like New York City and Philadelphia and Boston and San Francisco and Los Angeles. They were attacked by the, for this Henry Ford, you know, the very famous anti-Semite wrote a whole book about the Jews and how terrible they were. This is quoted in my book, and he talks about how they're responsible for bringing all this lowbrow culture into the United States, things, you know, stuff like jazz and the Lindy Hop. And it's true. He was right. (laughs) For him, it was that was anathema to American culture. And for me, I think he was right. It was anathema to the American puritanical culture that was dominant until then. Jews were very much very much a part of breaking the back of Puritanism in this country. So because of all that and because they were often acting, dancing, speaking like black people, they were considered to be black and therefore inferior. And they were denied jobs. There were quotas placed uh, by universities on admissions that limited the number of Jews who were admitted. Franklin Roosevelt was on the board of trustees of Columbia University. He voted, by the way to limit the admission of Jews because if that weren't didn't happen the Jews would they would uh, overrun the universities yeah and and in anti-semitism in this country a lot of people don't know this but it was very um respectable easy casual it was no big deal to make a jewish joke an anti-semitic joke until world war 2 and then of course that all changed because we had to have a rationale to kill the nazis we had to have a rationale to send boys from kansas who had never even heard of germany didn't know anything about Nazism all the way across the ocean to die, fight and die for this cause, which really wasn't about saving the Jews, but we had to give them a humanitarian reason to go there. 
The real reason, of course, was, you know, world domination, but in particular, uh, the domination of the central European core, the industrial core. We had to maintain control of that. But they invented this rationale, which was saving people, saving these other people. And so right then was when the federal government started to call Jews Caucasian, and they actually hired a bunch of anthropologists, famous anthropologists like Margaret Mead and Ruth Benedict, to make arguments publicly. They were paid by the federal government to write books, write pamphlets, give lectures, arguing that Jews were Caucasians, and they sort of reinvented the Caucasian, so-called Caucasian race, which encompassed everyone who lives or lived in Europe ever, which is the most absurd construct ever, right? So, <laughs> so overnight, because we had to go fight this war for dubious reasons, overnight, people from Spain and people from Sweden and Jews from Russia and Polish people and Irish people and Greeks and Germans and the English were all the same race. And to this day, that's what we believe. We believe that this thing called a Caucasian is a real thing. And that I'm a Caucasian, Pete, you're a Caucasian. And anybody who has European relatives is a Caucasian member of a, the Caucasian race, which makes no sense whatsoever. But that was in the service of fighting World War II. People don't know that. And it also, but the good news for the Jews was that it made them white. So after World War II, there was no longer a section on the census, a separate section for Jews, a separate box to check. After that, they were just folded in with all the other Caucasians, so-called. Caucasians included Italians and Greeks and Slavs for the first time, but most importantly, Jews. So, uh, And then you have what I call sort of the, <laughs> the gradual decline of a distinctive Jewish culture, which really comes out of Yiddish culture. You have certainly more. There's comedians continue. We still have Jewish com great Jewish comedians, but they're they're less raunchy. They're more assimilated. They tend to be more like Jerry Seinfeld, and less like Richard Pryor. Lenny Bruce, of course, was one of the last great Jewish norm breaking comedians. But you know what happened to him? He was persecuted and died young in the 1960s. And since then, we I think we've had fewer and fewer who have really been brave and and uh, sort of interested in violating taboos. Um, and Jews, oh, a lot of one thing people don't know about Jews is they dominated two sports before World War II. Guess what they were? Basketball and boxing. So the professional basketball league before World War II, which was the precursor to the NBA, a majority, a majority, more than 50 percent of the top scorers in that league were Jewish. Every division, weight division in professional mm -hmm. boxing had a Jewish world champion before World War II. Well, we know what happened to that. After World War II, they stopped being players and started being owners. And Jews became just what I say, what I call assimilated. They became part of American normal, normal mainstream culture. And, you know, they've certainly continued to contribute in a lot of ways to count the counterculture and to expanding of freedoms in various ways. But, you know, it's hard for many Americans to know the difference between a Jew and a non-Jew these days. Yeah. So there's your history. Let me jump into agorism because, or Sal the, Agor, Sal the agorist likes to call it agorism, and he, he goes mm. by uh, whatever, however Konkin pronounced it, that's what that's what he goes by, so uh, um, okay. uh, I'm tomato tomato on it. But um, I know that I was really excited when you announced it you know, over a year ago that you're going to be concentrating on agorism. I thought that was just friggin' amazing. Um, but one of the people that you have, who, who I've had on the podcast... 250 episodes ago uh, was Maggie McNeil, and I guess she's doing a course on sex work. So um, what's going on there? We are so proud to be the only college or university in the United States, probably the world, to have a course on sex work, on the history and politics of sex work that's taught by an active sex worker. That's Maggie McNeil. She is a sex worker. She lives in Seattle, lives and works in Seattle or is based in Seattle. She actually gets flown all around the country to uh, to do her work. But she also is the le probably, I think this is true, the leading public intellectual and activist for the emergent sex worker rights movement, which is really taking off and has been taking off for a few years now. I mean, they were on the front page of the New York Times magazine just a couple of years ago and getting a lot more attention and a lot more power and Maggie is teaching, yes, the politics of sex work for us, and that's that's online. You can buy it right now. She's uh, in her work clothes when she's teaching it, which is a, a deliberate wink at all the universities. Or actually, you know what it is? It's a, it's a deliberate fuck you to all the universities who would never dream of doing such a thing. <laughs> so she looks 
She looks like a prostitute. Yes. Oh, my gosh, ladies and gentlemen, because she is. But when she starts talking, it is extremely high level, very sophisticated analyses that you would get in a university. It's just they don't talk about the subject because they're scared of talking about things like sex because, you know, sex is not that important, Pete. It's something that should be uh, brushed under the rug. It's not anything that's you know, people think about or act on in any way. <laughs> so yes, Maggie, if you go to our you go to our YouTube channel, Renegade University YouTube channel, you can watch one of her lessons and then from there you can you can go and click and buy the whole course if you want to. So yeah, we're very proud to have Maggie as what well, central part of our faculty. And oh, this is something, another announcement. In addition to the school of agorism, we are going to be launching the school of sex, which is sex education. I just don't like that term. We're going to just call it the school of sex because that's really what it's about. And Maggie's going to help develop that. She's going to be one of our deans of the school of sex. And Carol Queen, for the listeners of my show, she's also going to be a major part of that. She's a very famous sex educator in the Bay Area here. And uh, she's going to be teaching courses on sex positivity, which, you know, people may have heard that term applied to feminism. Carol's been a huge advocate, one of the main sex positive feminist theorists for a long time and it's the it's the, my kind of feminism i think it's for your fans it, it's their kind of feminism as well so we're going to do a lot of courses on that and a lot of courses actually on how to have sex believe it or not this is this is something that is you know kind of missing in sex education in high school you know like what feels good how do you make your partner feel good how do you make yourself feel good i mean these things are not taught and they should be taught and so we're actually going to do that Carol has been doing those kinds of courses in, in San Francisco for decades. Huge, pe- huge audiences come. Lots of people come. It's, uh, and it changes people's lives. You know, it, it actually improves your sex life. It makes you happier. It makes, if you, if you believe that sex is important. So we're going to have the School of Sex unveiling very soon. Very excited about that. I hope that's not too radical for your audience, but I don't think so. At the brand new Renegade University, we have courses available on all the topics I'm discussing in this interview, including Maggie McNeil's Politics of Sex Work, My History of World War II, An Introduction to Nietzsche by Daniel Coffeen, and the video course version of my Renegade History of the United States. To become a member of Renegade University and have access to all these courses and many more, and be able to talk one-on-one with me and all of our instructors via what we call office hours, and in interactive online seminars, and to participate in our very own social media platform called The Quad, go to renegadeuniversity.com. Let's jump to, you were talking about Daniel Coffin and you were talking about Nietzsche. Why do you think it's important for people to study Nietzsche? Nietzsche, oh, well, I mean, he was the kind of godfather of the way of thinking that I have, he's the, I think he is really the first philosopher of freedom. He's the first major philosopher in Western civilization to advocate for what you and I, and I think a lot of your listeners would consider to be freedom. Philosophers before and since have largely been been concerned with building a correct society, a good society. And Nietzsche never was interested in that. He was interested in in self-actualization, in self-affirmation, in in finding out who you are, what you want, and getting it. He was the first philosopher to attack the politics of victimhood. He was the first philosopher to say that we should not have a slave mentality. We should not think about morality as a guide to how we live our lives, but rather we should really come from within as to what we do with our lives. We should decide what to do based on who we are and what we want. And if it comes into conflict with others, then we resolve that through various means, not necessarily violence, but we just, it's about, it's for him, it's really his philosophy. And this is Daniel's argument. Nietzsche's philosophy is not a philosophy of authoritarianism, which he's often labeled with. It's nonsense. He's actually a philosopher of joy and the affirmation of life. He teaches us to embrace and love and enjoy the lives we have right around us in our everyday lives, the way we feel in our skin, in our relations with people we know intimately, in our relations with the physical world, in the relations with our body. So that's what Daniel teaches. And it is, I think, 
obviously very consistent with libertarianism and any any political philosophy that has freedom and an embrace of freedom, individual personal freedom at its center. Sounds like I think anarchists would like it too. They should. <laughs> yes, a lot of a lot of anarch- I'm not the you know a lot of anarchists have already discovered Nietzsche in this way, so I'm not the first person to say this. But yes, he is. You could argue, I think he is the first anarchist philosopher. Yeah. Well, I know that you do. You have a course that's available right now that's based on your book, Renegade History, and one of probably my favorite chapter in it because I grew up hearing these stories was about gay liberation and Stonewall. And, you know, a lot of anarchists and libertarians, have you heard the term boogaloo? Uh, I mean, yeah, but it's a, it was a dance in the 1970s. I don't know what it means now. <laughs> now it's what a lot of pro-gun people are saying they're going to do if the government comes to take their guns. So they're going to oh. fight. They're going to fight back and they're calling it the boogaloo. OK. And they're going to fight back against cops. I wonder okay. how many of these people know that there was hmm. a group of people in New York back in the 60s who fought against the cops and won and they did it without guns not that i'm against using guns believe me um if if the cops come for your guns shoot back guys i am i'm all for that but no in the 19 in 1969 there was a bar in, on christopher street in greenwich village which was one of the many gay bars in new york city at that time this one happened to be owned by the mafia and it was actually a raid one, there was actually a raid one night on the Stonewall Inn that was intended to bust the mafia owners of it. But the Stonewall was known also as a place where drag queens were especially welcome, and in particular black and Puerto Rican drag queens from uptown would come down. They would perform there or just hang out. And uh, this night, <clears throat> and, you know, cop raids on gay bars were, you know, a weekly event in the 1960s, and uh, this was when it stopped. This night in June of 1969, one night the cops came to bust the mullahs who were running the place and a bunch of black and uh, brown drag queens started throwing bottles at them, punching them. They took the fight outside. They set cop cars on fire. They took trash cans and smashed the windows of those cop cars. They rioted in the streets for two straight nights. And here's the best part. They formed a chorus line. And they started doing, you know, kick dancing like showgirls. And they were chanting, we're faggots and we're not going home. We're faggots. We're not going home. And they fought tooth and nail those cops in the street. And as you said, they won because the cops in New York City ended the practice of raiding gay bars immediately. And then in every city across the country, that happened as well. So by the early 1970s, just a couple of years later, there were no police raids on gay bars ever again that's because people fought back not with guns but that would have been nice too but with fists and bottles and rocks and bricks they pulled the the cobblestones from the streets and, and from the street on christopher street and throw through those at the cops too and they set fires they fuck shit up and they said if you continue to do this we're going to fuck your shit up more and it was is actually a, a wonderful act of self-defense and one of the most i think liberating liberatory moments in all of american history and we are all the beneficiaries of that because it placed a limit on what cops could do. It made cops afraid to do certain things. And we always want cops afraid to do certain things like enter places where we find freedom, where we find ourselves, where we can be ourselves. We don't want cops in there. We don't ever want a cop in there. And that, that helped place a limit on that. It, of course, liberated gays and lesbians tremendously, but it also sent a message to America and then eventually the world that not only are cops not allowed in certain places, but that you can be a man and, and wear a dress. And it's okay. Maybe not just okay, but so great that men who wear dresses, who dress up like women and pretend to be women, will one day be superstars on television and have their own television shows. And they'll be named RuPaul. <laughs> and they'll be named Tyler Perry. And they'll be celebrated and wealthy. And they'll be on all the major networks. And they'll be talked about as American heroes. So that's the Stonewall Inn. That's, that's the Stonewall Riots. And that's, that's a major basis for, I think, American freedom today. Unfortunately, just a few years after that, the war on drugs kicked off and um, the mm. police 
now they pretty much can go into any home they want, unfortunately. Yeah, but they don't go into gay bars anymore. <laughs> and that's and that's important. I mean, it's a to, to place any kind of limit on state power, that's a hell of a precedent, right? People, you know, the state does not like that. They don't like not having access to space. And they stopped having access to that space. So it's a precedent for the rest of us. In fact, and this is what many uh, people on our side of the drug war have argued, you know, it's like, well, you don't go into gay bars and bust them anymore. Why, do, why the hell do you have the right to come into a grow house and bust us here? So, you know, it was important in all kinds of ways. And by the way, um, the American Psychiatric Association, the year after, two years after Stonewall, took homosexuality out of the DSM manual. It was no longer considered to be a pathology or an illness after that. So it, it, it really radically changed American culture for the better. Well, you had mentioned that you are writing a book on foreign policy. It seems like you've been writing that for a long time. Uh, yeah, uh, thanks for reminding me. Yes, I have. <laughs> <laughs> it's a big book. I can explain why. Um, it's, a, it's a huge book. My publisher, it was originally just going to be on the effects of American popular culture in the Middle East since World War II. And <clears throat> the publisher who bought the book, you know, this was sort of a, a wonderful compliment and really flattering, but it was also, you know, putting a giant cross on my back uh, with a boulder. Um, he said, they said, no, we want you to write the whole story of American popular culture around the entire world over the last 150 years, ever since there's been American popular culture and the diffusion of it. And I said, OK, <laughs> so that's why it's taken me many, many years to write this, because I've had to do research on all these other countries and the, the diffusion of American popular culture around the world into all these different places, these nooks and crannies. I mean, I had to I've done research on the number of phonograph records that were imported into Cairo in 1910. You know, that takes time. You know, I had to do <laughs> research on how many kids in Moscow were dancing the Lindy Hop in 1925. You know, I've had to do research on the number of blue jeans imported into Shanghai in the 1950s. And, you know, it goes on and on. And then I have to understand the politics of all these authoritarian regimes. And I'm mostly interested in authoritarian regimes outside the United States who have faced this. I've had to see, I had to do the research on how they have confronted this. And in, in every single case, uniformly, they have considered American popular culture to be as grave an existential threat to their existence as the American military. And I know this because they said this at the time. And so this is Mao's China. This is Stalin's Russia. This is Hitler's Germany. They all waged massive campaigns, propaganda campaigns. They also locked people up in prisons. They even shot people in the streets often who were adopting and loving and and spreading American pop culture like jazz and Hollywood movies and fashion and slang and cigarettes and having particular hairdos I and mean, which is was those all those things were always really popular. What wasn't so popular was getting bombed and having napalm dropped on them. So the authoritarian regimes they lived under hated them because they understood that American pop culture, that particular that low brow kind of pop culture represented or really was an expression of individual personal freedom, right? And it was not collectivist in any way. In fact, it was anti-collectivist. Dancing, sex, drugs, partying, all those things that American lowbrow popular culture have represented, those all are contrary to anyone who wants an efficient, well-ordered society that's managed from the top. So this has been a fight that I, I write about in, in renegade history of the United States within this country. So I've already documented that inside this country all the way back to Plymouth Rock. But then my publisher said, let's tell the story globally. Let's tell the story globally of this fight, this what seems to be an eternal or at least a very long lasting fight between the guardians of moral order, those people who are interested in social efficiency, those people who want a regimented society, and the rest of us or most of the rest of us who mostly want to have fun or leisure or, you know, go to the movies or not do things that require work and the management of others and punishing others and controlling others. That's the fight. That's to me. It was a civil war that I pointed that I showed in the United States and renegade history of the United States. And it turns out it's been a global world war for at least a couple centuries. Well, the one I wanted to ask you about, because I know that you've. Um, you've taught on it is World War II. And I love anyone who wants to give their own explanation, has come up, has written about why the United States did not have to get into World War II, especially you know, since there's there are phrases out there like, oh, it was the good war. So I know you said that it wasn't the good war. But so why did you say that? 
Well, it wasn't the good war for a lot of reasons. So, you know, there were two major theaters for the United States, Pacific and Europe. Everybody knows that. On the Pacific theater, the war with Japan, it has been close to a consensus among historians, so I'm not the first to say this, that Franklin Roosevelt and his administration for years, beginning in the mid-1930s, basically forced Japan to attack Pearl Harbor by cutting off their supply of oil, steel, and iron. 90% of the oil, steel, steel, and iron that came into, into Japan, and this was, a, Japan is a volcanic rock with no natural resources of its own. This has one, been, always been the great challenge for Japanese leaders. 90% of those crucial natural resources came from the United States, and Roosevelt cut them off. And so they had to expand outward. They had to go into Manchuria, then they had to go into Southeast Asia, then they had to go into the Pacific, into the islands. And that has been a consensus among historians that Roosevelt deliberately pushed Japan into a corner and forced them to be aggressive and forced, them, forced their empire to be even more expansionist than it already was. What very few historians know, and this is what I'm writing about also, is that Franklin Roosevelt and his whole cadre, his whole generation, but in particular this guy Franklin Roosevelt, had wanted to attack Japan and remove it as an obstacle to American expansion in the Pacific since the 19th century. So there's a very famous military intellectual named Admiral Mahan who wrote a lot of very influential books in the, in the late 19th century arguing just this. He said, you know, for us to control the world, we have to control the Pacific. And the problem is Japan has an empire with a military right there. And so we have to remove Japan as a rival in the Pacific. And Franklin Roosevelt loved Mahan's books and all the men around him in sort of elite boarding schools and elite universities were reading Mahan's books and loving it and believing in their hearts. I mean, from the time, I'm not kidding, that Franklin Roosevelt was 14 years old. I have documentation of this. He was talking about going to war with Japan. And all through his career, he kept talking about Japan. Japan, Japan, Japan was his primary focus. You could even say an obsession. Even when he was assistant secretary of Navy under Woodrow Wilson in the 1910s, he was calling for a preemptive war with Japan. And we know how imperialist and warmongering Woodrow Wilson was. Woodrow Wilson thought Franklin Roosevelt was a crazy man for this. <laughs> so then by the time he gets into office, here's another thing very few people knew about. And I didn't even know about this until I started doing the research. Roosevelt takes office in March of 1933. The second week of his administration, he, his second cabinet meeting, at his second cabinet meeting, this is in the height or the depths of the depression, right? Everybody's focused on the economy. That is what everybody cares about. It's We're in a so-called isolationist phase where the public does not want to go to war, like World War I again, where most of Congress is opposed to war. It's a, it's a great moment, by the way, in American history when most of Congress is anti-interventionist. Most of Congress sounds like Ron Paul on foreign policy at this point, and Roosevelt hated this. His second cabinet meeting, his second week in office, he laid out on the table in front of his cabinet maps of the Pacific. And he said to them, we're going to have bases here in the Aleutian Islands. We're going to have bases here in the Hawaiian Islands. We're going to have bases in the Midway Islands. We're going to have bases all over the Pacific Islands that we can take. And we're going to go to war with Japan. And his own cabinet members in their memoirs said, I nearly resigned when I saw this. I thought the president had lost his mind. So then he had to, of course, focus on the depression because that's all that anyone cared about. He was, you know, Congress, he couldn't get a war resolution from Congress at that point. But he kept this as an obsession. And by 1937, he started to up the rhetoric when Japan invaded Manchuria and began to put into action real plans to go to war with Japan. So another thing that people don't know, the New Deal is thought of as a set of domestic policies, right? The New Deal, you know, built the Hoover Dam, it built these libraries, you know, the WPA murals you might see in Coit Tower in San Francisco or in the libraries all over the country, schools, bridges, airports, lots of New Deal, pro hiking trails. Those were all New Deal projects. That, and that's all that anyone talks about. Most of the money that was spent by the New Deal, by the New Deal government, the Roosevelt administration, went to the building of the very first aircraft carrier, <laughs> went to the building of numerous battleships, went to the building of the United States Air Force Base, went to the building of 
thousands of fighter planes and bomber planes and bombs. It went into the military for a Pacific War. So, you know, I don't think, and all all this time, Japan wants to do what with the United States? Go to war with it? Of course not. Remember, it's a volcanic rock with no natural resources. What it wanted was, what it always wanted was trade with the United States. It wanted oil. It wanted to give the United States money in return for oil and steel and iron. And Roosevelt said, no, nope. You're not getting that. You're going to have to get your resources from somewhere else. And by the way, we're going to call that evil when you do it. And we're going to use that as a pretext for going to war with you. And so we moved the entire Navy. Another thing people don't know, the Navy was stationed in San Diego until the mid-1930s. Beginning in the mid-1930s, he moved the entire Pacific Fleet where? To Hawaii. Where? To Pearl Harbor. Almost halfway across the Pacific to Japan. Now, if that's not a threatening move, I don't know what is. And Japan knew this and the whole world knew this. They saw this coming. And so by that point, you know, Japan knew that if it didn't take out at least some of that fleet, it was toast. And they were completely right. So that's the Japanese story. That was not a good war. That was not a necessary war. It certainly wasn't a just war. And the number of deaths, the grotesque ways in which that war was fought on the islands, I'm sure a lot of your listeners know about this. Uh, the way people were killed on both sides, by the way. But this was the first time I've ever seen the New York Times stop talking about American casualties as human beings, but as numbers, because they were so great. It went from being, you know, five or 10 or 20 Marines dying in a day to hundreds or sometimes even thousands. And so it was just, it became numbers. And then, of course, the Japs, everybody started talking about Japs. It's no longer the Japanese. The New York Times headline said, Japs this, Japs that. And they weren't just numbers, you know, they were numbers of vermin. The uh, race, the racialization of the Japanese people during this time was off the charts. <clears throat> it became a, one of the <clears throat> one of the prized possessions. Souvenirs taken by GIs was skulls of Japanese soldiers. And instead of eBay, you could go into the newspaper and you could see classified ads for Japanese skulls. There were uh, gift stores in every city that sold Japanese skulls. Um, and where the where did that dehumanization end up? It ended up in incarceration camps, concentration camps built for Japanese Americans, as we all know. The great internment of Japanese Americans. Uh, oh, here's another factoid. Those internment camps, those concentration camps where the Japanese were placed in the deserts, guess which agencies built those? New Deal agencies. The great WPA, the Works Progress Administration, which built those lovely murals that we love to celebrate as a product of what government can give us. Yeah, they also built those jails for those people where children were kept because they were of a particular race. So yeah, I'm not a fan of that war. Then there's the European war. And this is, this is you know, this is where it gets tougher for people, but it's even more clear cut for me. So Hitler, well, he killed 6 million Jews. So of course we had to invade. What are you talking about, Russell? <laughs> and that's true. He probably did. We actually don't have evidence for sure that six million died, but I don't challenge that at all. I'm not a Holocaust denier in any way. The Holocaust fucking happened. No question about it. But it happened in a completely different way than we are taught. So the policy of Adolf Hitler and the Nazi party from its founding in 1919 until, and this is really important, everybody listen closely, the policy of the Nazi party, the official policy from 1919 until December, December of 1941, what happened then, was not the extermination of Jews. In fact, Hitler and the Nazi leadership punished, punished German soldiers for indiscriminately killing Jews. The policy of the Nazi party from 1919 till December until Pearl Harbor was the migration, the forced out migration of Jews. Now, this was totally anti-Semitic. They were anti-Semitic to their bones. I am not arguing anything else than that. Hitler was virulently, ridiculously, absurdly anti-Semitic from the get-go, as were all the Nazis. But they wanted to do it in an orderly fashion because they looked at the Russians who had been launching these pogroms, these spontaneous acts of violence of Jews, and they saw what happened as a result of that. What happened as a result of that was the Bolshevik Revolution, the communist takeover, which was largely led by Jews. Bolsheviks were, had a lot of Jews. And they said, look, if you, if you just run through the streets in the shtetl like shooting Jews randomly, they're not going to go away. 
they're going to become even more hostile to your nation state. And they might want to take it over, you dumb fucking Russians. So what he said was there are two kinds of anti-Semites. He called the Russians the anti-Semites of emotion. And he said that Germans, the good Germans like him, Aryans, Nazis, they were the anti-Semites of reason, rationality, clear thinking. We are going to find a place to put them outside of Germany and we're going to put them on our ships and send them there. Where was that place that the Nazis identified? It was this place called Palestine. So that was the Nazi policy from about 1935 until Pearl Harbor. For six years, the Nazi party, the German government run by the Nazi party, helped, and I'm talking about with finances, with training, and by shipping, move more than 50,000 Jews from Germany, from the Third Reich, to Palestine, which became what? The State of Israel. So yes, the Nazi party helped found the State of Israel. Not because they were nice to Jews, but because they wanted to get rid of them. But the point is that the Holocaust wasn't an idea, even, in the Nazi mind. They didn't have this as a concept. In fact, they were hostile to the idea of killing Jews in that way until the United States entered the war. Why? For years, Hitler gave speeches every year from the Reichstag in January. It was almost an annual uh, ritual for him in which he said to the world, but he was really talking most to the United States and to Great Britain. He said to them, after World War I, you cut up our country. This is true. You sawed off parts of it and gave it to countries that you invented out of whole cloth like Czechoslovakia, which didn't invent, wasn't uh, a country before World War I. They gave them part of Germany. They gave Czechoslovakia part of Germany. Poland didn't exist as a nation state before World War I. It was recreated. And then they took a big chunk of Germany and gave it to Poland. Everything west of the Rhine was given to the Allies. And so you had all these German people suddenly citizens of these foreign lands. And Germans across the political spectrum, communists, socialists, Nazis, liberals, they all hated this. They were all unified on that one issue, that what happened to the, Germany as a result of World War I with the Ver Versailles Treaty and its dismemberment was a grotesque injustice. So Hitler said, we want, first of all, to get that back. It is rightly ours. And he was right about that. I mean, according to the morality of the time and even today, I mean, I don't think anybody would find that to be objectionable. And now this is the this is the part that is objectionable. He also had uh, an idea about what he called Lebensraum, living space. He believed that Poland and parts of Western Russia were historically Teutonic. They were the tribe that became the Aryans that became the, the good Germans of today. And he thought that that belonged to Germany as well. And so he did absolutely want to invade and conquer Poland and Western Russia. And this is, again, is a consensus among historians. Now, the other near consensus among historians is that that was the limit of Hitler's ambitions. This is not nice. It involved the killings of hundreds of thousands of people. There's no question about it. It, it, it required a, a very major regional war. Nobody disputes that, including me. But that is all he wanted. He wanted to be a major power in the international arena, but he didn't want to control any space outside of Eastern Europe. He never wanted, and, and what was originally Germany. So he said over and over to Roosevelt and to the British government and the allies, he said, let us have this. Don't invade to stop us. And if, but if you do invade, if you do use your military to try to stop us, we will kill the Jews. We will not kill them unless you do that. And he said for years and years and years, by the way, we will give you our Jews. You say you love them so much, you great humanitarians, you great lovers of the Jewish people. We will put them on our own ships and ship them to you. All you have to do is open your borders to these Jewish refugees. And there were only 500,000 Jews living in the Third Reich during that time before the invasion of Poland. So could Great Britain and France and the vast United States, which was half the size it is now in population, could it have assimilated, integrated that many Jews? Of course it could have. Guess what the immigration policy was vis-a-vis -vis Jews in the United States from Hitler's rise to power in 1933 until the end of World War II? No entry. 
No significant number of Jewish refugees were allowed entry into the United States by the State Department, by the Roosevelt administration for that entire period. Same was true for Great Britain. Same was true for France. Same was true for all of the allies, all the European powers. They did not allow Jews to enter. That means they were trapped. They were left trapped inside that madman's cage. And then in 1941, they declared war on Germany. They did invade against Germany. So they started dropping bombs on the madman's cage who had been threatening to kill the people inside of it if the bombs were dropped. And so the Holocaust, and this is a number of historians have now come to this conclusion. I am not alone. It's just you don't hear about it in American popular culture much because we have to demonize Nazis for various reasons. The Holocaust, as we know it, was not even a thought, was not even conceived of until the late fall of 1941 when it became clear that the United States was, in fact, going to enter the war, was going to supply Germany's enemies, Britain and France, with tanks and bombs and planes, that, that Hitler was a dead man. Because once the United States entered the war with its vast military-industrial complex, its vast industrial machine that could just pump out weapons night and day, which it did, he knew his days were numbered. So his hostages, which is what they were, these Jewish hostages, no longer became valuable to him. They no longer had a use when he saw that it wasn't working, that the allies weren't listening, that they didn't want to take the Jews at all, that they didn't care about the Jews. They weren't going to allow them in, so they didn't care. So he realized they were useless, and he had to fight a war now against the allies while he was trying to conquer the East. So he had to then liquidate them to get rid of them as quickly as possible. So the very first extermination camp was in Chelmno, Poland. The very first Jews who were gassed, they were gassed the day after the declaration of war by the United States Congress. So the United States and its policies during that time did not cause the Holocaust. That's not what I'm arguing, but it damn sure guaranteed it. It damn sure guaranteed its fulfillment. If they had allowed Hitler to simply take that those regions and and again this was brutality beyond belief but this happened all the time including by the united states the united states had conquered where we're sitting right now where i'm sitting right now was a was exactly the same thing that hitler intended for poland right but it was a regional war rather than a vast world war world war ii killed at least we now know 65 million people which i'm arguing is largely because of american intervention America, in its intervention in the Pacific and in Europe, made relatively small, brutal for sure, but relatively small regional wars into a global war that killed tens of millions of people who didn't need to die. If they had simply contained those two empires, which they could have very easily, and dealt with them differently, we would have killed far fewer people. It would have been an entirely different story, and I think a much better world. Excellent. That's excellent information. Well, I'm going to wrap it up now. We're just a little bit over an hour, but before I do, I want you to remind people about the dates and the location of the next Renegade University. Event. Yes, sir. It's Renegade University in Oakland and San Francisco. It's going to be April 24th, 25th, and 26th. Get your tickets at renegadeuniversity.com slash live. Awesome. It is always a pleasure to talk to you, Thaddeus. Thank you. Always the same, Pete. Thank you. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To become a member of Renegade University and have access to all the courses I just mentioned on this show, go to renegadeuniversity.com and become a member. To buy tickets for the Renegade University weekend in Oakland and San Francisco, April 24th, 25th, and 26th, go to renegadeuniversity.com backslash live. Thanks for listening.